It does, yeah. Watch your stuff there. Right? Okay, the microphone's on already? Good. Ready to go. everyone. Uh, thank you for coming for the remembrance ceremonies here at Thornhill. Uh, this has become an annual thing for the last 10 years or so. And uh, I'm George Kent. Uh, I've been blessed with the opportunity of addressing you. And uh, I have a few uh, things that I'd like to bring to mind. Uh, why do we have Remembrance Day? Why is it on November the 11th? Well, for those that aren't familiar, and I know most people are, it used to be called Armistice Day. Then it was changed to Remembrance Day. Armistice Day being the 11th day, the 11th hour, uh, the 11th. And uh, it was when uh, Armistice was declared in the First World War. The war to end all wars. Well, that didn't work out, did it? 20 years later, we were right back at it again, the Second World War. And then we had the Korean War, and on and on and on. And during that time, many Canadians gave their lives. Uh, they gave their lives in the service of the country and for the benefits that we enjoy today with our freedom with one of the best countries in the world, in Canada here, we're, we're fortunate. Now, I'd like to say something here I haven't said before, but we remember those who gave their lives and are not with us now, and we're holding it at Thornhill. And I would like to uh, give a lot of my thoughts to the uh, members that we had here that were veterans. As it turned out, I ran the Veterans Tournament for the last four years, and uh, we had uh, uh, different connections, and as we lost members, we joined uh, York Downs, and we joined uh, St. George's, and uh, to build the numbers up. And we rotated that for a number of years, and all the numbers depleted and depleted, and finally, it was four years ago, we had the last Veterans Tournament. But the thing that always got to me was the fact that people that were in the service, uh, when they came back home, we never talked about it. Uh, you could be playing with a veteran and not know he was a veteran. Uh, you went to work, so you didn't question whether a guy was in the service or whether he wasn't. But you'd find out that sometime perhaps he was in the Army or the Air Force or the Navy or whatever he was in. And uh, this year, uh, I'd like to uh, have you remember some of our members that were in the service 
and were fortunate enough to come home. And they served, and it's a funny thing, when you join the service and you lace on a pair of boots, you don't know where you're gonna end up. You could end up with a desk job, you could be uh, join in Toronto and not leave Toronto, or you could join in Toronto and you move to Vancouver or all around Canada, or you could go overseas. And in this country, uh, we had two types of service. Uh, I won't get into the political side of it, but uh, what happened, we had uh, volunteer service. So you had to volunteer to go overseas. So those fellows that went overseas and didn't come back, they volunteered. Now, we had others that were conscripted into the army and they didn't volunteer and they served in Canada and that was their choice. But uh, it's one of the few countries where you had that option. Uh, in the States, if you get drafted, <laughs> you can go anywhere in the world, out and fight in the Pacific Theater or wherever. So much for that. But what I've done today, and I'll leave it out here for you to I'd like to get it back, but if I don't, I don't. I have a, a picture. Oh, I've got it here somewhere. I got a picture of a group that I played with for a number of years. It was called the Sunday Morning Dogs. And uh, Don Schaefer was uh, one of the members. And Don still played with them up to this year. Congratulations, Don, for your longevity. But this one here was taken 25 years ago, this picture. And uh, I counted up the number of guys in the picture, and there were 20 in the picture, and it was only two out of that 20 that weren't veterans. And yet, we didn't join up to play together as veterans. It was just the age group that we were that it turned out that way. And uh, there's only, uh, well, I see uh, uh, Russ Brankson's there, and I see Don there, and yours truly is there, and the rest of them are gone. And they must be remembered too, because they served and served well, and we're fortunate enough to come back. Would you put it on there? Yeah, pass it. Thank you. Thanks, sir. And there we are. Okay, now, there, talk about remembering people. Um, I had came up here to dinner uh, with the group. They invited me, the group that I played with last, uh, for their closing dinner. And uh, it came up that uh, some of the fellas, I couldn't remember, like a lot of the stuff, they weren't old enough to know that what happened in the Korean War and so on and so on. And it occurred to me just recently that a lot of Canadians wouldn't know about the Canadians first battle and where it took place and I would question you if you knew about Hong Kong now Hong Kong when I was still going to school high school that is I was still going to school and uh, Hong Kong took place what happened it was a related British colonial uh, property and uh, Canadians were sent over as guards they didn't expect to be in conflict well it didn't work out that way when they arrived they arrived and uh, I have to get my notes they arrived and uh, on August 19th 1942 pardon me that's uh, uh, December the 8th, 1941, stay corrected, I was a DF down here. Uh, and by Christmas, the uh, big battle was on with the Japanese. They waited for them to land, and total of uh, Canadians, and I have it here as well, You'll forgive me for not being too organized, I have it here, a publication of what happened with them and the numbers. 
Boy, all that time I spent last night has been lost. <laughs> um, well, it's worth waiting for. Here it is here. Okay. Yes. The defense of Hong Kong was made at a great human cost. Approximately 290 Canadian soldiers were killed in battle and while in captivity, approximately 264 more died as POW prisoners of war for a total death toll of 554. And today, you never hear of that. Very few Canadians even remember. And 554 people lost their lives being sent to Hong Kong. In addition, almost 500 Canadians were wounded. Of the 1,975 Canadians who went to Hong Kong, more than 1,050 were either killed or wounded. This was a casualty rate of more than 50%, arguably one of the highest casualty rates of any Canadian theater of action in the Second World War. And I can recall as a youngster, when I uh, heard of the Canadians going to Hong Kong, and I thought, oh, gee, Mom, that would be great. I'd love to go there. You know, that would be great. And, of course, I was a high school kid. What did I know? And this is the upshot. But you never hear about it, and yet it was the first battle. Now, of those prisoners that died, uh, they had a terrible life. They were taken back to Japan, uh, forced labor, worked deep in mines, uh, were just about starved, and starved to death some of them did, and it was a tragedy. But I thought I'd bring it up because I don't hear of it, and it's something that I felt you should know. Okay. say thanks to Don Brereton. She made it larger so that I can read it. <laughs> in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields the poppies glow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly. Scarce heard among the guns below. We are the dead Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow. Loved and we're loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up the quarrel with the foe to you. From falling hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. Though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Thank you. You can have it back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, I made reference to uh, the group that I played with and uh, some of the guys, and I'll just name off a few off the top of my head, that, uh, knowing what uh, they did. But um, John Griffin, you probably remember John. John was in the Army, he was in uh, uh, Major uh, Connie Spice Regiment. Uh, there was uh, Ed Young, he flew in the Air Force. Uh, as did uh, Ken Keller. Now, Ken wasn't a member of our group, but Ken we lost just a year ago. 
uh, last July. And uh, there were so many guys that I've seen come and go. And uh, as I mentioned, out of that group of 2018 were veterans and there's only three left. And uh, I remember all the guys that did a great job in what they participated in. And when I said that nobody talked about it, all of a sudden when the guys got to be about 65 and going on 70, they looked back and reflected, I'm sure, what a big part uh, of their life the war played. And it's true. And some of them did have some stories. Uh, if you remember a member here, he wasn't in the same group as us, but Roley Harper. Roley Harper and uh, Don and I, we celebrated the 75th of uh, D-Day this year, June the 6th. The three of us had lunch here and we were joined by uh, a civilian member who is uh, a resident, <laughs> displaced resident in London, England during the Blitz. The four of us had a nice lunch. And the thing is, we all had stories. The one story that Roley told, and this is the luck of the draw. He was a paratrooper with the 48th Highlanders here in Toronto, and he went overseas, and after D-Day, he did a drop behind enemy lines. They, uh, to traditionally, as, as parachuters do, they buried their chutes, and, got organized and six of them met up together and they had to go and hunt out the enemy. They were behind the lines. They came to a road and uh, they decided to split up. Three would go one way, three would go the other way. And what did they do? They tossed a coin and Roley went with his two guys one way and the other three went down the road the other way. Well, Roley tells the story that they didn't get very far down the road and you hear rat a tat tat a tat a tat And the other three were kids. By the toss of a coin, Roley could have been going in that direction. And that's the way it was during the war. There were so many times and so many things that just changed your destination in the future, whether you're going to be alive or whether you weren't. And uh, the only thing I bring it up, and it, I don't want to get modeling about it, but this is why we have Remembrance Day, to remember these people. And if you go back and if you were old enough to be, as some of us are, that we were at school, and then the kids went and all joined up, uh, you remember the ones that didn't come back. You remember, uh, for instance, on our ball team, uh, the whole infield was in the Navy. We never talked about, to each other about joining the Navy, but the whole infield of uh, a baseball team who won the championship here in Toronto. Uh, the pitcher didn't join the Navy. He waited and he got drafted and he went to Italy. He's the only one that didn't come back. He became a cook. He didn't want to fight. He wanted to be a cook. And they got bombed in Italy, and Jackie didn't come home. And some of them held out. It, it almost as though they had a premonition that they didn't want to go into the war. And a lot of them that I knew that sort of felt that way, they didn't come back. Uh, was a member here. Uh, he and I played golf for years. We grew up together at the same Bible class downtown Toronto. And uh, Bill Osler and Leo Bandel and myself. And uh, Bill joined the Air Force. I joined the Navy. Uh, Leo, he uh, went in the Air Force, never came back. He went down after a bombing raid plane went down in, in the, the, uh, the sea. So you never knew when you laced on a pair of boots where you were going to go. And uh, I think that just about does it.
All right, and uh, we'll, We're gather around the flag pole. we'll gather around the flagpole. And I know it's such a lovely day, you won't mind getting out there enjoying the sunshine. It'll be lovely. Thank you.